Have you ever noticed that a lot of the greatest discoveries in science are made by the youngest scientists? Today I want to talk about why that is. I've got some theories about it and I'm also going to take you on a little guided tour of Sydney. That there is a school. Looks just like Hogwarts. How awesome would it be to go to school there? You have an amazing view out over Sydney Harbour. This here is Shark Bay. But I don't think you should be worried because the last shark attack here was in 1934. And since then they've added the shark net there, which I think, you know, cuts down on the shark attacks quite a bit. So I better substantiate my premise that young scientists really do make some of the most revolutionary discoveries. Well, 1666 was the Annus Mirabilis, that is the miracle year of Isaac Newton. Because in that year, he came up with groundbreaking theories in optics, in motion, mechanics, and he also invented calculus, which is a totally new type of mathematics. And in that year, he was 22. It's kind of mind-blowing. Albert Einstein's Annus Mirabilis was 1905, and in that year he published three papers, each of which was probably worthy of a Nobel Prize. One on Brownian motion, so about the existence of atoms and molecules and how they could jiggle around. Uh, one on the photoelectric effect, explaining it in terms of the photon theory of light, explaining that light must be made up of particles. And of course, special relativity, which changed our views of space and time and leads to general relativity and a new theory of gravity. All of that in 1905, and he was the age of 26. Charles Darwin was in his mid-twenties when he voyaged aboard the Beagle and went around the world looking at finches and tortoises and all that kind of stuff. And he hadn't even had his 30th birthday yet when he formulated what would become the theory of evolution. Now, of course, he waited till he was 50 to publish it, but the good idea came, you know, before he was 30. Parsley Bay. So far, the amount of parsley I found here. But they do have a very nice suspension bridge. So why is it so important to be young if you're gonna make a profound scientific discovery? Well, I've got a number of theories about this. I mean, one might be that your intellectual capabilities are at their peak, sort of in your mid-twenties. Up until that point, they're still developing, and beyond that point, they start to decline. One thing is that young scientists may not have a lot of other commitments, and they have a lot of drive. For Stephen Hawking, he had a lot of motivation when he was younger. Because when he was 21, he was diagnosed with motor neuron disease and told he only had two years to live. Plus, he then found a woman that he wanted to marry. But in order to get married, he thought, well, he, he's going to need some money. And in order to get money, he's going to need a career. And to get a career, he needs a PhD. So he wrote one hell of a PhD and ended up winning some amazing prizes that he shared with Penrose, a legendary physicist, and he was only 23. So that's the thing about being young. You don't have a lot of dependence and you've got a lot of motivation. You got a lot of time and you got to prove some things. So it's good to be young and working in science. I think that all of these factors are important, but by far the most important factor is that a young scientist's mind is not cluttered with previous knowledge. You know, there's a number of quotes like one by Mark Twain, which says, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And I think that that's particularly the case. Like when I studied for my PhD, I was looking at the prior conceptions that students bring to physics, which really hinder their learning. But I think the same is true in a more general sense for all physicists. Once your mind becomes certain of certain things, it becomes difficult to break free of that. And generally it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have these prior knowledges that sort of focus your attention and keep you on track and make sure you don't go off on some crazy tangents. But if you're really to make a revolutionary impact in any of the sciences, you need to have that ability to think laterally. And I think having a lot of prior knowledge inhibits that. So perhaps that's one of the reasons why a lot of these major discoveries don't come from older scientists, they come from younger ones. For example, Einstein was able to make this dramatic leap with special relativity, that space and time didn't have to be absolute, that they could actually be tied to each other, dependent on each other, and they could change depending on your observer. The, the idea that a second for one person in the universe is not the same amount of time as a second for someone else in the universe is a shocking idea. And I think the prior knowledge of all of the other physicists working at the time would have stopped them from making that leap and saying, well, the speed of light must be the constant thing, and so space and time must change. Or you can think about Charles Darwin. He wasn't wedded to any particular ideology. He was simply looking at the facts, looking at all these slightly different creatures on these different islands and thinking, 
how does it make any sense that you know a creator would design these different beings and plant them on different islands? Isn't it more likely that they would start out as a single type of organism and over the generations they would have sort of selectively evolved based on the different environments on those different islands? And that got him to thinking about the whole theory of evolution. So my point again is, the more baggage you bring with you to a situation, the harder it is for you to make that great lateral step that turns everything on its head. Don't you find that when you're young, nothing seems too peculiar? Like an Easter bunny, for example. A, a bunny that goes around laying chocolate eggs. Like, bunnies don't even lay eggs. How does that make any sense? But to a child's mind, you don't know what's normal, so you don't know what to think is really abnormal. And I think this is, again, one of the major benefits that a young scientist has. You don't know what is really, really abnormal, and so you're willing to let your mind wander there. It's kind of like in a dream. And to my left, we have Lady Bay Beach, which is a nude beach. Um, and the population of that beach is quite skewed. How do I put this? Um, it's a bit of a sausage party, I'm not gonna lie to you. Now, I should probably make the important caveat that not all amazing scientific breakthroughs have been made by young scientists. It's not like once you are over 30, that's it, and you should give up. It's like a, a gymnast career. But how do you make a contribution if your brain function is kind of in decline by the time you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s. Well, the brain has an interesting way of dealing with these things, where it can get more perspective as you get older, because it starts chunking all of your prior knowledge together in ways that allow you to automate it. And I think that gives you a, a greater overall perspective of a whole field and allows you some different insights that perhaps the young scientists can't see. So there are benefits both to being older and to being younger. This is the old lighthouse keeper's cottage, and we're just coming up on South Head, right around the corner here, and that over on the other shore, that is North Head. So this is the opening to Sydney Harbor right here, where Sydney Harbor opens out into the big, wide Pacific Ocean. I want to talk a little bit more about how the brain learns. You know, when you first learn something, you have to put a lot of conscious effort into it. Like if you're learning how to tie shoelaces or tie up a tie or drive a car, you need to put a lot of thought into what you're doing every step of the way and you need to be coached along doing that. That makes sense. But over time, as you repeat and repeat those processes, you learn to do them almost automatically without even thinking, without using up your conscious space. Now, in your consciousness, you have space for about, let's say, five things at one time. So I could give you a list of five objects, for example, and you could probably store those in short-term memory and repeat them back to me. And similarly, if you're doing some tasks, you can kind of use up five chunks in your working memory, but beyond that, things get very difficult. So the point is, in order for your brain to work well, what you need to do is repeat a whole bunch of basic functions and get those things kind of automated so that they don't take up a lot of those five chunks. They can maybe just take up one chunk and then that allows you to do multiple things at one time like eating and walking at the same time, vlogging while you're driving. These are all things you can do because your brain has automated these things. Now a lot of people like to talk about muscle memory but of course that's ridiculous because your muscles don't have any memory. The memory is all in your brain, but it feels as though you have muscle memory for particular things because you've done them so many times that those memories are all effectively automated. They're all chunked together. Now when it comes to thinking about science, you know, for me when I think about a particular idea in science like, uh, you know, F equals MA or inertia, that is one chunk to me. I don't need to think carefully about it every time. Uh, not as I would have had to when I was learning about it because I know it so well because I, I've done so much work with it and that really helps me when I go then to analyze any further situation because immediately the concept of inertia is is something that I have innately. If you learn particular steps and you practice them enough and you automate them then you don't have to think about them as much when you go to execute them and that allows us to do very powerful very complicated tasks but that's how it has to be done. In the 1800s, a shipwreck off the coast here, off these rocks, killed all of the crew on board except for one person. And he went on to become the first lighthouse keeper of this light. 